Market Musings with Fairbairn and Russell. Welcome to the Market Musings podcast, where a podcast today with a slight twist. Uh, you can call it a presentation podcast or a podcast with live visuals. But regardless of what you want to call it, we're very pleased to welcome back Mike Moles, who is the technical director of Cavango Resources. And today, Mike is going to be showing us some pretty visuals and, and talking to us about them. So, so Mike, you're very welcome. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, fine. Good. It's great to have you on. And of course, we have Kenny with us as well, as usual. Hello, Kenny. Yep. How are you getting on, Mike? It's good to good to speak again. It's been it's been some time. It's probably five or six months since we we done that last market musings. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, no, it's 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 good to be back together again. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and you you were saying off air that you're not enjoying the uh, UK winter. You're not usually in the winter. <laughs> Well, yeah, because I spent, I spent most of my time in South Africa and, uh, you know, because of COVID and so on, I've sort of uh, found myself uh, stuck here for a bit. But uh, I'll be heading back to uh, Southern Africa uh, in January. So I'm uh, looking forward to getting back to some warm weather. All right. Is it going to open up, you reckon, in January to get back in? Um, yeah, I think that. Uh, well, look, we've we've already started uh, the, um, the 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 exploration is now back in full swing. Yeah. Um, and there's very little uh, that COVID is preventing us from doing now. It's one or two things, slightly more tedious, but uh, otherwise, uh, it's all systems go. Yeah, and obviously, South Africa is a perfect base for uh, for the Kalahari Suture Zone is what we're going to be talking about today. Yep. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, it's not a, it's not very far away from uh, from Botswana. Yeah, so we've got. Um, I mean, we spoke last week, Mike, me and you on Stockbox, where we were talking about the news that was coming out of Kavango, um, and we mentioned that we would probably get together um, as we are doing now to to look at some of the visuals that the company has created, and maybe you know explain a bit about them, uh, what it is you're looking for, what type of deposit you you, you know you, you're pretty sure is there. You keep mentioning the Rilsk, why that's important, and why some of the sort of graphics that you that you're going to show us today, some modelling. You know, gives further evidence to uh, to that being the case. So, um, what we'll do is we will show the slides that uh, that you're talking about um, when we put this together in the video form. But um, but yeah, I mean, you've got your presentation there. Do you want to uh, do you want to start start us off? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, well, just I'm going to go through. There's quite a few slides. I think it's 17 or 18 slides, so I won't dwell yeah. on them for too long. But um, sure. Kenny or Mark, if you if you want to stop me at any time, please do so and uh, ask questions or if anything's not clear. Some some of it, some of what I've got to say is maybe a little bit technical. So um, uh, please uh, interrupt me uh, sure. for cl for clarification on any of these things. So yeah, if we start off with uh, slide one, this is a sort of the introductory slide, and there's a map there of. A, a geological map of uh, Southern Africa. And you can see Botswana is, is slap bang in the middle of Southern Africa. And right there in the middle of uh, about as far away from the sea as you can get is the Kalahari Suture Zone, which uh, when we first decided to um, do exploration in Botswana, um, it was really the first thing that we, we identified as being a um, an extraordinary uh, magnetic anomaly, which uh, nobody really knew very much about and very little exploration had been done on it. Um, and we really wanted to know what this thing was and whether it had any potential, uh, particularly for magmatic sulphide uh, deposits. Um, and magmatic sulphide deposits, as will become clear, are, are essentially um, copper, nickel, plus or minus uh, platinum group metals, mm. sometimes cobalt, uh, combined with uh, sulfur in the, in, the, uh, in, in the magma system of uh, intrusive rocks. So uh, there it is. That's, uh, that's where we are. If we move on to slide two, mm -hmm. this is the magnetic trend that we identified. Mm -hmm. It's about 450 kilometres long, so it's a, it's a huge... Uh, feature of the magnetic map of Botswana. It, it, it 
covers sort of like uh, uh, about an eighth of uh, the whole of this uh, of uh, Botswana, and it's in the southwestern part of Botswana. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we have concentrated, most of our work has been concentrated in the north, where there was what little work had been done um, was uh, also tended to be concentrated in, in the north. I think that's partly because um, the, uh, uh, the magnetics uh, looks like they were more co- uh, conducive to, to mineralization. Um, you see there that the, these are our licenses. Um, there is a, 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 a gap in um, uh, below the, the northern section, which where the, the uh, magmatic intrusives are much more deeply buried, and, and uh, there were some licenses there anyway. Mm-hmm. So we, we sort of avoided that. And then you'll see there's one license sort of slap bang in the middle. And then south of that, um, there is a big national park. So we've sort of avoided the national park. We don't want to get involved in that, even though the Botswana government were very happy for us to work on the national park. Um, You know, these days, it's a non-starter, really. You've got to keep away from those, uh, those things. So and then we will, uh, our plan really is that uh, next year we'll we'll open up um, a major uh, effort to uh, explore those southern licenses um, okay. uh, as well. So Kavango's so, one is, is the is the black outline. Black ones, yeah. yeah. Well, these ones, I, I don't know if you can see my cursor. These yeah. these blue ones here, uh, Detail. That's a diff- That's ours as well, but that's a different project. That's the Detail yeah. project. Which is basically a carbonatite uh, project, a uh, mm-hmm. very different uh, type of target. Okay. Um, so I think the first thing, well, let's just have a look at the northern section. If we go to uh, slide three, that is that northern section, and these are the licenses which cover that northern that northern section. And the the purple areas are the magnetic highs, and the the blues are uh, magnetic lows. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't want to get too too fixated on those uh, on those magnetic uh, highs and lows because the, the unusual thing about uh, the Kalahari Suture Zone is that there are two generations of uh, intrusive uh, uh, magmatic intrusives on the Kalahari Suture Zone, and they're separated by about a billion years, um, and they are. Com- uh, just sitting one on top of each other. And in fact, if we can just jump ahead to uh, slide five, I can show you this is, this is the magmatic, uh, magnetic model that we, we created. We only finished it uh, uh, in August. Hmm. But um, the darker green is the, uh, the Proterozoic uh, intrusives. These are, are gab- they're gabbros. Uh, uh, both sets are, in fact, Gabbro, but the uh, the dark green is about um, a, a, about uh, a, well well over a thousand million years a billion years old, uh, whereas the light green is about one hundred eighty million years old. So mm-hmm. there's an enormous difference in age, but you see they sit more or less right on top of each other, mm-hmm. and I think that's partly because the conduits the the faults and fissures. In deep, deep in the Earth's crust, that allowed the magma to rise up towards the surface, uh, were still active, or or had at least be uh, were used by the um, uh, the younger uh, uh, magmatic uh, intrusives. So they used the same faults, the same the same um, uh, conduits to bring the magma mm-hmm. to the surface, and in fact. When we look at this in section, you can see that in some cases, those intrusives are sitting one on top of the other. They're actually uh, uh, contacting uh, each other. Mm-hmm. So let, let's just go back to to um, slide three again. One of the useful things was that uh, the Canadians had done some drilling here uh, in the 1980s. And they drilled about eight or nine holes up and down the uh, uh, 
the KSZ, the, the suture zone. Um, and I don't think anybody really appreciated that there were these two quite separate um, generations of, of, of magmatic intrusives. Um, and I think that uh, subsequent to that drilling being done, there were a number of Canadian firms that thought this looked like an interesting target. And they went out there, I think in those days, in the 1990s, uh, the infrastructure was quite poor. Uh, the technology certainly was not what it is today. And um, after some time, I think they gave up. They found drilling was a little bit too difficult. It was very difficult for them to interpret what was going on. And I think that they felt that the intrusives were too deeply buried mm -hmm. um, to be commercially uh, viable. And so by um, the turn of the millennium, they'd pretty much given up and uh, gone away. And so it wasn't until we came along in uh, about 2011, I think, when we first started uh, looking at this, uh, we, we went back to have a look at the core which, for, uh, were, uh, which had been from the drilling that had been drilled by the, the Canadian Development Agency. It was an aid program. And we found that the, um, the core had been very well preserved in a government core shed. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I've got a little slide here. I mean, this is quite impressive. This is uh, slide four. Mm. Uh, this is the core shed. Um, uh, the, so the Botswana Geological Survey, they keep all the core that's ever been drilled mm. uh, from uh, geological um, exploration uh, programs uh, neatly stacked away in this enormous uh, core shed in Kang, which is actually not very far away from um, where, we are, where we're working. And uh, beautifully preserved, and even though it was sort of like uh, uh, forty odd years mm. old, we were able to get it all out. The the staff there helped us get it outside, put it out, lay it out on concrete, um, uh, uh, like a big car park thing, and we were able to relog all the core and uh, look at it very carefully, and take um, magnetic measurements and so on. So this was. Uh, you know, a, a, a tremendous um, bonus for us because there are very few, very few countries in the West uh, uh, that would would, would keep uh, the core in such good condition. Yet alone in Africa, I think it's almost uh, unheard of. But um, mm. that has been a great help to us because it meant that we it meant that we didn't have to go and drill. Uh, the drilling had already been done and the core was already there. They even allowed us to take uh, small bits of the core for analysis uh, and thin section work, mm -hmm. um, and it didn't cost us uh, anything at all. So, you know, it's just such a pleasure working in Botswana. Mm. Really That's helped. great to have that. Yep, yep. No, it's, and, and we've actually been back. We went back there, I think, um, about uh, six weeks ago, because we mm. wanted to have a look at another another borehole, and they got it all out for us, and we okay. took some more samples. So, yeah, no, they've been really helpful. And the electromagnetic that you showed us a second ago, so that was, is that historic? Or is that what you you guys have done? Um, now, hang on a minute. To the oh, this this stuff here, uh, this this image. No, the slide three. Oh, slide three. Ah, uh, that yes. So this, uh, you're quite right. Yeah, this this was done by uh, sponsored by the Canadian uh, Aid uh, Program again. Uh, it was uh, first first they first uh, did the first flying I think in the 1970s, and it was upgraded again in the 1990s. Okay. Uh, yeah. So all this information is uh, free. You can just go okay. and uh, uh, acquire it. And um, they, you can take copies of the digital data, okay. and then you can process it in the way that you want it, uh, or you can even buy maps yeah. um, from the uh, Botswana Geological Survey. Okay. So, yeah, a tremendous, uh, tremendously helpful. So that's a government-sponsored scheme, then? It is, indeed, yeah. yeah. We didn't pay for any of this. No, okay, uh, okay. Yeah. And it's done so by an so aircraft flying electromagnetics over the land? It's well, just magnetics, not electromagnetics. Magnetics. Uh, okay. So there's a, there's a difference between electromagnetics and magnetics. So this is these are magnetic surveys. Okay. 
They were flown, I think, at this this particular series was flown at 500 metre line spacing. So it's, it's quite detailed for a regional program. Um, a lot of other countries will only done it at one kilometre uh, line spacing. So mm. um, it's very, by and large, it's very good quality. The high quality stuff is not over the entire country. There mm. are sections which are still relying on the old uh, 1970s version. Mm. But uh, for our uh, for our purposes, it, it's very very useful. And it's returning the, the images. It's returning. It, it's it, it does it, does, it doesn't guarantee there's a resource there. It just shows that there is there's something there. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it shows you you've got a huge magnetic uh, anomaly. A magnetic uh, anomaly. Um, yeah. And you you know that it doesn't immediately tell you what it is. Um, you know, to a certain extent, you've got to go down yeah. uh, onto the ground and, and do some drilling to find out what it is. You might have a good guess, mm. um, but you don't know what, what it is or, or how deep it is. There are lots mm. of things that, mm. well, you can find out by um, uh, playing around with the data. You can uh, work out how, how deep some of these mm-hmm. bodies are. Okay. But I think what is uh, what's really interesting is if we go back to uh, slide five, mm-hmm. um, the what you're what you're seeing in that magnetic map are really this the dark green, uh, which is the Proterozoic, the very old um, uh, intrusive bodies, because they are much they're much, first of all they're much bigger as you can see, and secondly they are much more magnetic. They have a much higher um, magnetic susceptibility. So. The magnetics of the Proterozoic uh, intrusives rather drowns out the magnetic effect of the um, uh, of the Karoo uh, mm-hmm. intrusives, which are these light green mm-hmm. ones. And it's the light green ones that we are particularly interested in. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're interested in them uh, uh, mainly because they are closer to the surface, and a lot of these Proterozoic ones are very deeply buried. Um, and the other reason is, is that we know that uh, the Peru gabbros, the, the light green ones, uh, by and large were intruded into Karoo uh, sediments, which contained uh, coal measures, and the coal measures uh, uh, contained a lot of sulphur. And we know from the Norilsk model mm. that uh, the uh, that when you get uh, uh, these intrusive Gabros intruding into coal measures or any other type of sediments which contain uh, substantial amounts of sulfur, uh, you get the development of, of uh, sulf- uh, metal sulfide deposits forming um, in association with uh, the emplacement of these um, uh, intrusives. Mm-hmm. So uh, the, I've got, there's another there's another shot here uh, of these on, on slide six. It's more or less the same thing, but it's from a slightly different view. So in order to construct this model, what we did was we we took the the magnetic data from the regional uh, uh, survey, uh, mm-hmm. which we've just been talking about, mm-hmm. um, and we've also used all the information from the boreholes, which uh, we found in the core shed, and we were able to take magnetic susceptibility readings all the way down the core so that we got a very good idea of of the magnetic susceptibility of all the different rock types that these drill holes pass through. So by primarily using magnetic data, we were able to produce a 3D uh, magnetic map um, with the aid of some very sophisticated um, uh, data processing uh, from a company called Mirror Geoscience, who are probably the world's leader in uh, manipulating uh, this sort of data. And this is sort of technology which, you know, the Canadians in the 1990s had no access to at all. I mean, uh, you know, we sort of tend to forget that in the 1990s was a sort of dark age as far as uh, as uh, uh, technology, uh, data technology is concerned. So we've come a long way in the last uh, uh, 30 years. And uh, so we, we've been able to produce this map 
almost without spending any money um, on collecting the data because most of the data was already available. We did, however, uh, carry out some uh, airborne EM surveys, which partly uh, helped to uh, get better detail on the magnetics, um, but also allowed us to identify um, conductors um, below ground. Now, these the EM conductors, uh, it's another, another geophysical system which um, energizes rocks uh, from a helicopter. I mean, it's I suppose it's a bit mind-boggling, isn't it, that a helicopter flying up and down uh, is pumping electricity into the ground um, from, uh, from the sky mm -hmm. and is picking up um, responses uh, from the rocks uh, below uh, very quickly, uh, is flying up and down at uh, considerable speed and is able to identify um, the, the, the electrical Mm -hmm. conductivity of the of the rocks that uh, that it passes over uh, and i think the hope was that uh, we might be able to pick up mineralization right then and there but um because a lot of these karoo sediments are co very conductive in themselves and also partly because the groundwater in these karoo sediments tends to be salty and in fact, if you go to a borehole out there and you, you pump water out, and a lot of the locals have to drink the water, mm. uh, it has a very brackish, salty uh, taste to it. So um, that, so salty water uh, is, is very conductive. And so it, um, it does uh, mask the, mm. uh, uh, the signal somewhat. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we'll come on to how we dealt with that in, in a moment. But let me move now to slide seven. So this is a this is a uh, a view of the of the model that we constructed with the help of Mirror Geoscience that shows only the Karoo um, mm -hmm. gabbro. So mm -hmm. what what we've done is because we know that the Karoo gabbros have a different magnetic susceptibility to the Proterozoic gabbros. Uh, we're able to remove the Proterozoic gabbros and remove the influence that they are having so that we can just look at the, uh, the Karoo uh, gabbros. And this is what, this is what, uh, this is one view. I mean, you can fly through it, over it, under it. You can d take sections through it, through the middle of it in any direction you like, because it's just data. Um, and you can see that the, there is a particular sort of shape, uh, quite a sort of typical shape to these um, gabbros. So they, they're marked by these thick zones, which we've called keels, um, and thin zones, um, which we've drilled into one or two of these, and they're sort of 15, 16 meters thick, uh, whereas these uh, keels can be uh, five, six hundred meters thick. And we'll come on to the significance of that in a minute. But if we just move now to, I'm just going to jump ahead to slide 11. Mm -hmm. And this is a, this is a, a drawing of, the, of, a, of a typical um, uh, gabbroic intrusion at Norilsk. Mm. And I think you can see this. This was a, a, it's a sketch done by somebody who studied uh, uh, the Norilsk deposits uh, for some for many years. And this is a this is a typical sort of uh, morphology of the uh, of the intrusives. And I think you can see that you've got this thick zone. It has this slight sort of mm -hmm. swelling on the top, and it has this deep keel here, and then. It tails out mm. on, on each mm. side uh, into these sort of thin uh, gabbro sills, and I think that you can you can see that it's not that dissimilar to what we were looking at just now. We go back to slide seven, mm -hmm. and you can see a very similar sort of morphology uh, here. So I I thought that was I mean when I saw that I I got very excited because I thought well you know this is exactly what we're seeing at yeah. Norilsk, and we're seeing a very similar sort of uh, 
morphology at least um, at um, on the on the KSZ. Okay, Mike, j- just for the benefit of our listeners, Mike, could you maybe explain you know the scale of the Narolsk uh, mine? Yeah, um, well, it's <laughs> the Narolsk mine is is I would think it's the largest mine in the world. Um, it, it it is absolutely enormous. It uh, I think it has. Uh, I think 90,000 people work at Norilsk. Um, it has, it's in the Arctic Circle. Uh, so, you know, it's a, right now, it's permanently dark. Um, it's, a, it's not a great place to go to, I would imagine. It, it suffers from huge amount of pollution and uh, whatnot. It was discovered, I think, in the 1870s, uh, but really wasn't developed properly until... Just after, just after the uh, Second World War, um, it has the, you know, it, it provides virtually all of the nickel and copper for uh, for Russia. Uh, I can't remember all the all the figures now. I've got them written down somewhere, but it's you know like twenty percent of the world's nickel comes from um, uh, from that one mine. Yeah, sure. uh, it has uh, resources. Which will last for at least uh, seventy years, and that's if they don't find any more. Um, so it is a, it, it's a, it's an order of magnitude bigger than anything else, uh, any other mine in the world. Okay. Yeah. I think it's also worth saying that it, it's quite deep. I mean, the ore, the ore bodies that they're mining now are between five hundred. And 1,500 meters uh, in depth. Um, clearly, the the richer uh, a mine is, the deeper you can you can go. And uh, of course, in South Africa, there are uh, mines there which go down b- uh, beyond two two kilometers in depth. But um, you know, particularly when you start off, you don't want to have to go down too deep before you start uh, getting to Pay dirt. Definitely, is, definitely. is that any help? Uh, did I answer? Yeah, no. Yeah, no. It's. I mean, most people have heard of Narels, but you know, it's just nice to explain. You know, the, the, the scale. Yeah, of, it's of, it's absolutely enormous. It really is huge. And uh, anybody who's interested, you can look it up on uh, Google or something. You'll see all the facts there and how many. You know, what what, what the production is and so on. Uh, it, it's uh, really impressive. Um, right, so uh, there are just a couple more slides here that I just need to go through. Uh, slide eight. Um, this is this uh, from the model. Uh, what we did here was to work out the thickness of uh, these um, uh, these intrusives, and so the 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 green here. I'm sorry, it's not a particularly easy. Uh, uh, diagram to mm-hmm. to interpret, but the green is essentially the um, uh, the 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 gabbro intrusives, and the where you see these like a line here of um, these purple dots. Mm. Each one of those purple dots represents a section line that we've gone through. I don't know whether I can, if I can. Here we go. Is that? Um, yeah, it's pretty clear, Mick. Getting up ah, there, yeah. You can see we can see that technology is wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> um, look, okay, so here um, you can these figures relate to uh, the depths. So if we take this one here, uh, twenty-four means that's twenty-four meters to the top of the uh, Gabbro intrusive, and seven hundred and seventy-four is the number of meters. To the bottom of the intrusive, mm-hmm. so you can see that it's pretty thick. It's a thick mm. keel. Whereas if you go um, somewhere else, uh, you can see that these things are quite thin. Mm. Uh, I'm trying to find one which is a bit closer to the surface. I can't see one right now, but but I mean here, you see, for example, there's a section. We've done a section through there, uh, 270 uh, to the top of the intrusive and 291 to the bottom. So you know it's very thin there. It's only uh, twenty odd meters. Mm. So, in most of the cases, the gabbroic intrusives are quite thin. But in some cases, uh, 
you 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 have the the intrusives are, are, are very deep, are very thick, mm-hmm. and because we can see here, there's like this key. So the keel of the intrusive is running in this direction, and it is it maintains its thickness all the way along. So it's like um, it's like a a Viking ship, okay. So you're looking along the keel of the Viking ship. Mm-hmm. Um, it's sort of boat shaped, and uh, uh, so the deeper part, and that I mean that is about uh, eight to nine kilometers long, maybe a bit more. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Not too sure, but you can you'll find these all over. The, you see, there's another one here, which although is they're not so deep, you can see that they're running in a line. Mm. Um, yeah, here's another one here. You see this running along along here. And so the, 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 these the, deep this. keels are very important because that is what we're looking for. And I'll explain. We'll explain why it's important to get the keels. If we just let's go back to the Norilsk uh, one at uh, slide eleven. Oh, hang on. <laughs> Got to reduce it. Um, there we go. So we're looking. We're looking along the strike of the deep keel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is this is this is the boat, as it were. Now, uh, we'll, as I say, we'll come on to it in a bit later on. But the, for various reasons, which I will explain later, the the sulfide metal sulfides tend to work their way down towards the bottom of the of the keel. So you need the deeper parts of the keel in order to uh, find substantial uh, quantities of uh, of sulfide. Mm-hmm. And in this particular case, you can see here this purple area, there's is, is massive sulfide. So that's nearly all sulfide, which is running along the base, along the base here. Um, now, there's just this, this one here. That's just a very small, uh, just to get an idea of the scale. So you've got your Karoo gabbro sitting on top of the much larger Proterozoic gabbro. This is somewhat different from Norilsk, I have to say. I don't think, as far as I know, there is no earlier generation of mm. uh, gabbros at Norilsk. This is somewhat unique in us having two generations. And in fact, it may well be that the Proterozoic um, uh, gabbros are also mineralized, but they're going to be, by and large, they're going to be probably too deep to. Uh, uh, to do the necessary exploration, which is why we're just sort of sticking to the to the um, uh, the Karoo Gabros, where we are, you know, uh, within mineable mineable distance from the from the surface. And here, I'm just on on slide ten. Um, there is another view. This is an actual view um, of one section through a small part of the. Uh, uh, of uh, uh, magnetic um, mm-hmm. uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, plan. That's quite well, a nice one. Yeah, I mean, you can see here that, I mean, you're looking, uh, uh, again, I think the long axis will be, will be uh, coming in and out of the picture. But you can see on the edges there, you've got, or it tails off into these what I call gull wings, mm. and then another one is beginning to form uh, on the on the right hand side of the image, and it's towards the bottom where we're going to most likely find um, mineralization. Mm-hmm. See at the top here, you've got a thin layer of Kalahari sands, which you have to get through before you get into the uh, the Karoo sediments. Mm-hmm. Um, now there's just one more slide here that I want to show you, which is so we are at the moment we are have have just hang on a minute. Okay, go back to I'll go back to I'll go back to where we were the slide ten. Um, the what we're trying to do now is to find the 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 mineralization that occurs in or around the bottom of the uh, of the of the intrusive of the intrusive, you can pick these um, metal sulfide uh, deposits up with EM conductors, which I've already mentioned. The 
The one thing that you need to do really is to, because we've got other conductors in the, in the sediments, which can cause um, uh, a problem for identifying uh, conductors in the, uh, in the intrusives, uh, is that you've, you need to know exactly where the uh, intrusive is in, in three-dimensional space. Because if you find a conductor, which, is, which you know is inside um, the intrusive, the Gabbro intrusive, then the chances are that it's going to be um, a sulfide deposit. In other words, a, a mineable deposit. If it's lying outside in the, in the sediments, it's much less likely to be uh, mineralization. So one of the things that we're doing right now, as we speak, in fact, is to, is to do much more close-based magnetic uh, surveying. So we've reduced the... Um, the magnetic survey down to uh, so initially to 200 meters. Remember, originally it was 500 meters. The airborne uh, mm -hmm. uh, survey was 500 meters. We've now reduced it to 200 meters. And in places, we're reducing it further to 100 meter line spacing. That means that we can, we can adjust our model or, or make our model that much more accurate so that we know exactly where this uh, intrusive body is in, in 3D space so that when we find a conductor and we know where the conductor is, if we can place it within the intrusive, then we know that we're onto something and something that we can, we can drill at. Okay. I don't know. Is that clear? <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's, it's much easier with our with the presentation. Yeah. The reference definitely hundred percent. Okay. All right. Fine. So now the, the the problem also with the EM is that because we we have these uh, spurious um, uh, EM signals which are coming out of the sediments, which sometimes mask the uh, conductors inside the, uh, the the Gabbro intrusives, uh, we need to do something to to make it much more accurate so that we can we can place a conductor right in the middle of the uh, of the intrusive uh, and we can also discriminate between what we call formational conductors which are conductors in the in the uh, in the sediments with uh, conductors which are in the intrusives because the conductors in the intrusives will be much faster they will be much more conductive so we should be able to discriminate between them. So there are two things. One is that we will be able to discriminate the faster ones from the slower ones, so that, that will help us identify conductors in the intrusives. Um, but also we will be able to know exactly where these conductors are in 3D so that we know that they are, in fact, inside uh, the intrusive and not hanging around outside in the, uh, in the sediment. So. What we did, if we go back to uh, slide 12, we've, we've identified four areas. We, we, have, we could have chosen more, but I think we thought, well, let's start with four. So there are four areas that we've, uh, we've uh, decided upon, which we are going to carry out very detailed, uh, first of all, very detailed magnetic work, and secondly, very detailed EM work. Mm -hmm. And uh, because these are areas where we've got these uh, long uh, keel-shaped uh, bodies, um, which are likely to uh, contain uh, massive sulfide deposits, um, and uh, we, by by concentrating on those areas, uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, uh, identify targets. Uh, on which on which to drill, mm -hmm. um, and you see, like for, I don't want you to get too too fixated about the the magnetics because remember that the mag, the magnetics here, what you see, there's a very nice big mm. uh, strong magnetic uh, body here. But remember that that is almost certainly Proterozoic, um, and so you know it, it's it's really it's it's of interest. 
But what we're more interested in is the is the uh, Karoo gabbro, which is sitting on top of it, which you barely can identify from just looking at its mm, okay. uh, re- regional magnetic. It, you see, it's actually very, it's quite complicated. And, and, you know, I've also been doing some work on the Kalahari copper belt, as you, as you know, uh, where, you know, it's so, so much more simple. <laughs> mm. I mean, this is quite complex and you, you would not be able to do this type of work uh, uh, 20 years ago, no, probably not even t- 10 years ago, because the um, uh, the technology has moved on uh, so rapidly uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years that uh, we're able to do things now that you, know, you can't even imagine that you could do uh, uh, a, de- a decade or, or so ago. Right now, I just want to now come on to these... Um, uh, what made you, just before you go on, Mike, what made yeah. you pick C and D? Yeah, well, uh, yes. You see, uh, um, like I, I said, don't get too fixated on what you see on the underlying magnetics. It looks, if you look at C, you'd say, well, it doesn't look as though there's anything there. But in fact, there is quite a lot there, but you're not seeing it because what you're seeing here okay. is, the, um, is the magnetics that's derived from the Proterozoic uh, gabbros and not from the okay. Karoo gabbros. So the signals from the Karoo gabbros is is completely masked by the signals that you're getting from the Proterozoic. So it does. I mean, I've only put these here to show you, uh, you know, approximately where these target areas are mm-hmm. and how big they are in relation to the overall. Uh, project. Okay. The, incidentally, this is this particular. Pro, this is the northern section of the Kalahari Suture Zone, which we call the Hukunsi uh, section. Uh, Hukunsi is a small town just to the south of the south of here. So, look, there are probably another dozen or so targets that we could have we could have picked. Okay. Um, you know, there is an enormous uh, potential here, and you can you could virtually go anywhere on on in this section and find uh, uh, good looking targets uh, on which to concentrate. So our geophysical team uh, have, have looked at all the sections and they, this is what they've picked out. And they, they think that these are, are the best, uh, the best looking targets from, from a number of different uh, perspectives uh, from borehole data. You see these holes here, these are all boreholes. Some of them are quite shallow, just, uh, Water boreholes and so on, but um, you know all of that data has gone into constructing this three-dimensional model, and unfortunately, you know we we can't sort of fly around inside the model at the moment. Um, but the, when these guys sit down in front of their high-powered computers, they can fly around inside it and they can pick up the the areas that look most uh, most prospective. Mm. Okay, sure. So. Right. Let's let's start looking at this series of uh, schematics that have been uh, produced by uh, uh, some people who've been asked to uh, produce these things from little sketches that uh, that I've done, and I think they've done a very nice job. Um, so I'm just going to go through these quickly um, and pick out some of the more important points. Uh, so this is a this is a diagram of a, a Karoo intrusive. And we can see that at the bottom here, you've got uh, metamorphosed basement rocks, which are quite tight, uh, very hard rocks. And these, this is a, shows a, a, a fissure or a fault in the, in the, in the rocks up which magma had has uh, intruded, intruded into the uh, sedimentary rocks, the Karoo sedimentary rocks, which contain, which contains coal, and uh, significantly they t- they contain carbon and sulphur. These rocks in in quite large amounts, and uh, you need the carbon as a reductant, and you need the sulphur to um, extract the uh, the metals. So. Let's let's just follow the the magma. So the magma comes into the well, it 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 
it actually erodes away the country rocks because these these Karoo rocks are sort of relatively soft sandstones and uh, mudstones and so on. So as the magma comes up, it it erodes away the walls of the dike which is coming up here and incorporates a lot of the material, the surrounding material, the Karoo sediments, fall into the magma chamber and the ch magma chamber keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bits of the uh, Karoo uh, sedimentary rock fall falls into the magma and is melted or at least partially melted uh, and is incorporated into, into the mag magma. As the magma ascends towards the surface, it finds particular uh, sedimentary layers which are weaker or, uh, in this case, probably um, uh, sedimentary layers which are high in uh, coal measures or, or, or coaly shales, um, which it can exploit, and the magma pushes along underground uh, in a horizontal uh, direction rather than the vertical, uh, the vertical direction in which it, it first arrives into the into the sediments. So these and these are the gull wings that we've been looking at in previous in previous slides. Because they are relatively thin, they tend to cool more rapidly. Um, and once they cool, uh, the uh, the lava the, the crystals in the lava lava uh, solidify and um, and the, uh, uh, and and so the crystallization is quite fine. You get fine, uh, small crystals forming. But in the in the bulk of the in the deeper parts of the in, intrusive, it remains very very hot, um, and uh, will will cool down much more slowly. And as crystals start to form, as it does cool. Uh, those crystals will be much larger and will allow um, sulfide material to drift down towards the bottom. So here we can see, you know, there are atoms, if you like, or, or atoms of copper and nickel and, mm. and uh, platinum group metals and cobalt and zinc and all sorts of other metals uh, in here. Uh, which are floating around in the in the in the magma because you've got excessive amounts of sulfur. The sulfur then combines uh, with these metals, and the metals actually have a greater affinity for sulfur than they do. If there was no sulfur, they would end up in the silicate crystals because there was nowhere else for them to go. Um, but because there is sulfur around, they they combine very nicely with the sulfur, and they form. Metal sulfides, so mm -hmm. that'll be you know copper sulfide or nickel sulfide or cobalt sulfide or whatever, um, and that forms a what they call an immiscible liquid. So the uh, the sulfide uh, then becomes a liquid which won't be taken up by the silicates. It remains as a as a liquid. When I say immiscible, it's like oil in water. Um, it will stay um, as a, a sulfide liquid, and because Metal sulfide liquid is quite heavy. It tends to drift down uh, towards the bottom of the mm. uh, intrusive, um, uh, preferentially, um, because the metals are quite uh, quite heavy in comparison to the silicates, which are the majority of the rock forming um, material forms a silic silicate. Um, so I think that's all I can say on that one. Let's mm -hmm. just move on to the next one quick. Now, this what all this really shows is that what's happening here is that uh, molten magma is, is constantly coming up through the feeder zones mm. into this magma chamber, and then it it passes out along the the sills, these horizontal sills, which are not very far away from the surface, so maybe just a few tens of meters below the surface. And occasionally they will break out, uh, and uh, in fact, very often they don't even form volcanoes. They just opened up fissures in mm. the ground. And you may have seen 
pictures of fissures opening up in Hawaii, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and lava just pouring out. It, it tends not to be very explosive. Uh, the lava just pours out, uh, and and sometimes for days, months, even years, mm -hmm. uh, the lava will just keep flowing out of these of these fissures, and eventually it builds up quite a layer of basaltic lava, which you can see here just on the surface here, this brown colour. And uh, it, these, uh, the, it can build up uh, thicknesses of lava uh, over uh, a few hundred thousand years. It'll form thicknesses of, you know, one or two kilometres thick. Uh, so an enormous amount of material uh, flowing out onto the surface. Now, that is constantly being replenished by more and more lava coming up from the mantle uh, from deep within the below the Earth's crust and replenishing the, the the lava or the magma which is being extruded out onto the surface. But what's really interesting is that as it comes up and it comes into this magma chamber, this sulfur is keeps getting keeps combining with these metals and forming this immiscible. Uh, metal sulfide, which tends to sink back down towards the base. So you can see that you're getting a constant enrichment of these metal sulfides, because every time you get a new pulse of magma, there is more metals coming into the system. More sulfur is being eroded off the walls, combining with the metals, and more massive sulfide is mm -hmm. being produced. Now, you... you you continue this process for a, a few million years, and you can see that you're going to get a fairly substantial deposit of metal sulfides forming either towards the bottom mm. or along the walls of, mm -hmm. the, uh, of the intrusive. Okay? Mm -hmm. So if we just go now to this slide here. Sorry, this is slide 15. Um, this is sort of coming towards the end of the... Um, of the period, I mean, the, uh, we're talking about uh, a million years or so, mm. which in geological time is not a great amount. I mean, we're looking at uh, something that happened about 180 million years ago. So if this process went on for a million years, um, there would be plenty of time, as you can imagine, to accumulate a large amount of uh, metal sulfides. Okay, so what's happening here is that as the as the magma is eroding away these wall rocks, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't erode them away evenly. I mean, I've made it look like it's going evenly, but in fact, there'll be all sorts of nooks and crannies mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, there'll be bits going off into the side walls here and, you know, tunneling in and then blind end, ends. It's, it's a real mess. So the metal sulfides will tend to form, first of all, relatively close to where the source of the sulfur is, which is on the wall rocks, um, or they will sink right down to the bottom mm -hmm. uh, where they'll accumulate uh, towards the bottom. So wall rock mineralization is quite important. You do get preferential uh, mineralization along the, along the walls uh, and less so right in the middle. Uh, so when you're looking for a target, you're either looking at wall rock mineralization or mineralization associated with um, the uh, the bottom of the of the magma chamber. Okay, so what's happening up here is that the sill the sills the uh, the, the molten uh, magma is cooling too fast. The grain size uh, is very fine. Uh, and you get the development of, of silicates early on in in the piece, which actually prevents uh, the movement of metal sulfides, and in many cases prevents the formation of the metal sulfides. Mm -hmm. It's only where you've got, you know, it really good and hot that you get the uh, metal sulfides uh, forming, and also because the uh, the uh, silicate uh, crystals are very large, the metal sulfide liquid can gravitate down through the, uh, 
the, the big uh, silicate crystals towards uh, towards the towards the bottom. So if you drill in here, you're not going to find very much. Uh, but if you drill right down here, this is where, at least in Norilsk and in Bozis Bay, and there are you know at least a dozen uh, world class. Um, magmatic sulfide deposits around the world, where th this is the this is the typical pattern of the uh, development of the mineralization. So um, that is really uh, uh, what is going on. And we go to, we, now we come up to date, and I'll show you this slide, which is which is where we are now. Mm -hmm. So what's happened now is that the the, the basalts, the the lavas have largely eroded away. And in fact, on the, on the Kalahari Suture Zone, there is no basalts left. There are some a little bit to the north, but by and large, they've eroded away. A lot of it has been turned into sand or mm -hmm. clays, which form the Kalahari, what they call the, the Kalahari Cover, which now sits on top of, of the Karoo. And you can see here, typically 20 to 70 metres thick. Um, which, of course, is what makes finding these things, you know, that much more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but if it wasn't difficult, somebody would have found it long ago. So that's why we're here. So um, now we can see that when we come to the exploration, we are looking for high priority targets. So these, these are your wall rock mm -hmm. deposits, and these are your uh, basal deposits. And... What we're looking for is uh, conductors, these EM conductors, which are, are found using a ground EM system, which I'll come on to in a moment, uh, called the Large Loop uh, EM uh, Survey. Um, and by identifying these conductors and knowing that those conductors are inside or within the Gabroic intrusive, um, we then have ourselves a drilling target. So we know where this thing is, or we know where this thing is. I mean, these things can be quite deep. I mean, they can be 600 meters mm. down, which is expensive to drill. These will be a lot closer to surface. So mm. if you find a conductor on the wall rock, uh, which is, you know, two, 300 meters uh, from surface, I think you're, you're better off to go for that and maybe leave this for... Uh, for later on, but mm -hmm. some of the world's biggest uh, uh, magmatic sulfide mines uh, are only mining uh, uh, wall rock, so okay. um, you don't actually necessarily uh, need to mine this, or at least not uh, initially. Mm. Um, I think that's about it. Uh, yeah. yeah so you're basically you're, you're you're drilling into an old magma chamber and, and hoping to get the wall of that chamber. Yes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. So what? Yeah, I mean, and and what we what we want is to find those conductors. Yeah, those really, f and they're very fast conductors. They are an order of magnitude faster because it's like a copper wire. All these sulfides, when they form, like down here, they form what they call a massive sulfide. Mm. So all the sulfide crystals are actually touching each other, and they're metal, and they're highly conducted. Mm -hmm. It's like passing a, a an electric current along a copper wire. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll it will go through very very fast, mm. and uh, the receivers in the EM survey system can detect that. If the conductors are in the wall rock in the sediments, mm. they will be much slower, and uh, you'll be able to distinguish between the very fast speed of the conductors uh, in the in the magma chamber um, as opposed to because, those which because are, it's more it's more dense. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, no, it, it, because it's more conductive. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it it allows electricity to pass through it much faster than in than in the uh, in the sediments. You right. see, like yeah. the okay. sediments yeah. might only be conductors because they contain a lot of salty water. Okay, yeah. salt water yeah. is conductive, but it's not very conductive. Mm -hmm. It's not not nearly as conductive as say a copper wire mm. so uh, maybe that's what you would be trying to distinguish mm. you know, the okay. conductivity of salty water as opposed to the conductivity of copper wire yeah 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 
Anyway, I'm just going to show you these last two slides, sure. um, which is a little cartoon of how we're going to, in fact, we've already started. They're, as we speak, they're now laying out these large loops. Mm. So this is a technique which has been developed, I think initially it was developed in Australia where they have very deep weathering. Um, and it's been adapted by a, uh, a, a geological, a geophysical consultant who we have engaged to uh, undertake this work. And they are working on this right now on, on area eight, target area eight. So what they do is they lay out a loop, uh, a square loop, um, one kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer. It's a cable, uh, a reasonably thick cable, and they lie th lay that out in the bush on the ground. And then you energize it with a transmitter and you pump about 120 uh, amps of electricity into it. So it's quite a, quite a fair amount of electricity that you pump into this thing. And it sets up a field, uh, 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 an electromagnetic field. Uh, and that electromagnetic field energizes the ground beneath it. And the bigger the loop, the deeper you can go. It also you also can adjust the frequency of the electromagnetic signal. The lower the frequency, the deeper your signal will, uh, will penetrate. So this is a, it's a huge advance on airborne EM because airborne EM is not able to pump very much electricity in the ground. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you just don't get the, uh, uh, the precision and, and detail that you would get uh, from, but you know you can't. The airborne airborne EM is great for covering very large areas very quickly and relatively cheaply. But once you've got a target, uh, you really need to identify exactly where it is on the ground using this uh, this mm -hmm. uh, ground system. So you've now set up a field, uh, an electromagnetic field around this large loop not only are you are you able to to generate um a, an electromagnetic field within the loop but you're also gener generating a, uh, a field outside the loop uh, and up to two kilometers um in any direction from the uh, uh from the the loop itself so you can you can using this system you can you can uh, uh, carry out a survey over nine square kilometers at a time. Now, obviously, it takes quite a while to lay out a one kilometer by one kilometer. And that's a whole day's work for a team of you know seven or eight people. Um, and then it will take a couple of days for you to then uh, uh, you take the move the receiver up and down lines over that nine square kilometer uh, area. To pick up the signals that are coming from the from the uh, the potential uh, the potential ore body. Mm -hmm. If we just move on to the last slide now, the slide eighteen, uh, we can see uh, you know this is really the next stage. So now you can see you've got one hundred and twenty amps coming into this thing. Here's your your uh, the field that is that is set up. Uh, uh, creating an electromagnetic field. So when it meets something, when that electromagnetic field uh, encounters something which is conductive, it's the conductive body itself is energized and creates its own uh, electromagnetic field. So it's what they call a secondary um, ele uh, electromagnetic field. And that can be detected from using a, uh, a receiver. So you'll have a receiver team. In Australia, they use trucks and they just put the damn thing on a truck, truck and they run up and down on a truck. You can't really do that in the Kalahari. There's too many trees, so you've got to do it by hand. You've got to have receivers strapped onto somebody's back and they just walk up and down these lines. But the lines, I think, are 200 metres apart uh, and you just keep walking up and down, up and down, uh, taking readings and the data is then collected and processed and from that you the uh, the data will pinpoint uh, conductors 
where those conductors are uh, and also the intensity of the uh, electromagnetic signal that's, uh, that's coming from them. So if you can then place your conductor into a, a magma chamber or a gabbro intrusive, um, then you've got yourself a target. And then the next thing, of course, will be to, um, uh, to drill that target, provided it's within, uh, you know, drilling distance from surf surface. But, um, you know, if you're drilling sort of uh, three, four, 500 meter holes, uh, you've got to be damn sure that your drilling is really accurate and uh, you don't miss it. Um, and that is, uh, well, that's, <laughs> that's our next problem. But I have to say that drilling, drilling um, uh, capabilities have also improved enormously in the last 15 to 20 years. So, you know, you can get uh, very accurate directional drilling, which can uh, pretty much uh, put your drill in exactly the spot that uh, you intend it uh, to be. And it's constantly monitored uh, using various uh, digital equipment and so on. So at some, so this, um, as I say, the, 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 the first grid is going in now as we speak. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that we will get the whole of the target A area uh, completed before Christmas. Then we'll take a break. And then we'll go on to, in January, uh, middle of January, we'll start up again uh, on targets B, C, and D. And then there'll be a period, well, uh, the processing will start uh, as the data comes in, but I would imagine that it's going to take a while to process all that data, to interpret all the data, and probably we'll, we'll talk to Mirror Geoscience, but I think that we can, we can incorporate the, uh, uh, the position of these conductors uh, into the 3D magnetic model. Um, I, I see no reason why that can't be done. I'm not 100% certain that it can be done, but uh, uh, we'll see. I'm not a geophysicist, so this is all second-hand information. Um, but anyway, they, I, I, I would anticipate that we would be um, looking at identifying drill targets uh, towards the middle of, uh, of next year, something like that. Okay. And that's about it. Um, so... Uh, if there's anything that's not clear, let's... Uh... No, it's all it's very clear, I think. Fantastic okay. graphics um, yeah. and explained very well. What What's at the bottom of the old um, old gabbro? Is it, it, presumably it doesn't go to the centre of the earth anymore. It's it's all, you know, cold and sealed up. Um, yeah, well, uh, yes, everything is, everything is now uh, solidified yeah, and yeah. now solid rock. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Although, of course, those weaknesses in the Earth's crust uh, are still there. Mm -hmm. So maybe in a few million years or a few yeah. hundreds of million years' time, those maybe come active last again. weaknesses may open up yet again. Yeah. And, and a third generation of uh, mm. gabbroic intrusives might, might, uh, uh, might penetrate up towards the surface. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's been a fantastic way to show the deposit, Mike. Um, and how um, how and how it's formed as well, and then how you've worked out that what you know what's there, and then there's large loop surveys that you know, we've spoken of them before, but I've never I, that illustration shows very clearly how they work. So I mean, yeah, yeah I have no questions. <laughs> I think it was very clear. The, the only thing I was going to add, Mike, was uh, have, have you guys got first mover advantage in the area? I mean, there's nobody else doing this in the, the case said at the moment. Yeah, it said yeah. Well, no, they're not. And look, I think that there are uh, there are reasons for that. I think that you know this is quite this is sort of uh, technologically uh, right up there at the front end of uh, of uh, um, uh, ge geological exploration. Um, you know, most companies are not doing this type of work. It's quite it's quite difficult. It's quite complex. Uh, you need to have people who really know what they're doing. Um, and, um, you know, we are constantly looking at, I mean, in fact, one of the things that we're looking at right now is using seismics. And uh, you, you probably know that seismics is used in the oil industry. 
uh, for and essentially you, you cause sort of uh, controlled explosions on surface, and the uh, the sound waves uh, or, or no, the sound waves or the pressure waves, I think, um, you know, bounce back and give you an indication as to uh, where the sedimentary layers are and where certain bodies underground may lie. It's never been used uh, before for this type of for this type of work, but you know technology has has moved on, and uh, we're now critically looking at the possibility of using seismics to give us uh, additional uh, confidence that um, as to where the uh, where these uh, gabbroic intrusives are. Whether we're going to use it or not, I don't know. But I mean, you know, we are always on the lookout for new technologies and uh, assessing them and seeing whether they they may be useful or not. I mean, when we did our um, airborne EM, uh, we, we, uh, we wanted to use very low frequency airborne EM. Um, and we were using frequencies which were not uh, available uh, to most people. Most people had never used um, the very low frequencies uh, EM that we, we were using. So, you know, again, we were sort of, you know, pushing out, you know, the uh, the boundaries of uh, of technology. So I think, you know, a lot of people, uh, this is this is probably a bit too difficult for a lot of people. But yep. our, our feeling was, was that we wanted to find something really big, you know, and, I mean, we weren't interested in, in finding a small little, Gold mine. We wanted to find something, you know. Maybe we're a bit, bit too uh, ambitious. I, I don't know, but uh, I think that um, you know, the, the idea was to think big and uh, and to try and come up with uh, some ideas on, on how you would find these sort of magmatic uh, sulphide bodies when they were hidden, because most. In fact, all as far as I know, all of the magmatic sulfide bodies that have been found to date have had some sort of uh, surface expression. We've got no surface expression here at all. Uh, we've just got some drill holes and we've got some indications, uh, quite strong indications, that uh, we're in the right ballpark. Um, so it's an ambitious uh, project and I think that rather puts a lot of people off. Uh, but I've no doubt that if we are successful and we get uh, some intersections, uh, some big intersections uh, of, uh, of massive sulfides, uh, then we'll <laughs> we're going to find a lot of people all jumping in and yeah. uh, trying to grab the ground. Yeah, hundred percent. No, it sounds like you've got your, your hands full for the next five or six months anyway with exploration. So the, there should be plenty of news flow from your uh, from the data that you're gathering. So. Yeah, I think I think we'll get you on maybe again, Mike. Maybe in the next couple of months, once you've got uh, you know three or four of these uh, these loop surveys done, and yeah. then we can we can uh, maybe you'll have another presentation for us by then with more more detail. Yeah, no, absolutely, Kenny. And uh, you know, it's actually very useful for me as well because I have to sit down and actually think about how do I explain it, mm. and it sort of solidifies the whole concept in my own mind mm. as to. You know what we're doing because you know very often we're sort of feeling our way. Uh, you know there is we are there isn't a uh, there isn't a textbook on this. You know we're sort of uh, doing this as we go along, and mm. uh, some things work and other things don't. And um, as I said before, you know on the on the copper belt, you know, things are quite straightforward. There, I mean, you know we know how to do it. We know how the exploration is done. It's fairly standard stuff. This is this is something uh, exciting and new, and, mm. and I think that's in a way that's why I enjoy doing this much more because it's uh, it's much more challenging and much more exciting. We're 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 doing stuff that other people haven't done before, mm. and I think there's a you know a very good chance of uh, of success. And you 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 say there's no textbook on it. I notice in an RNS that you have you commissioned um, a university um, report. Was it? Yeah. Um, well, there, of course, uh, there uh, the 
the concept of magmatic sulfides mm. is, a, is a sort of discipline within economic geology. And there are at least a couple of dozen sort of experts in the field. Mm. Uh, and these are people who've made a study of known uh, magmatic sulfide deposits. Uh, Norilsk, Kaposis Bay, Zhang in uh, China, uh, uh, Thompson deposit. There's a, there's a whole bunch of them. Uh, and even, Su- even uh, Sudbury in Canada, which is a little bit different, but uh, has, has, has many similarities. Mm. So um, there is a lot known about these deposits. Um, and there are textbooks in terms of what it is that you're looking for. Uh, and, you know, what, uh, we have one of our consultants uh, is uh, Dr. David Holwell, from Leicester University, who has sort of helped us uh, a good deal, actually, in saying, well, look, if you, are, if you are trying to identify magmatic sulfide deposits, then there are certain things that, that you need to tick off, uh, important attributes to a magmatic sulfide deposit that need to be there or should, or pre- uh, uh, should be there or preferentially uh, should be there. Uh, in order to um, uh, have the right conditions, in order to uh, uh, have uh, there have been developed uh, these massive sulfides, and um, you know we've gone down through the list of, uh, of attributes that he set us, and we've been ticking off the boxes. I think there's only about one or two boxes left that we need to tick, hmm. and those actually are things that we need to do uh, using. You know, electron microprobe uh, equipment and so on, which we don't have access to at the moment. But he, the University of Leicester, does, and so we're working with uh, uh, the University of Leicester, um, and um, uh, hopefully next year. Well, in fact, definitely next year, we will uh, get some of the results of the work that we're doing. But basically, it's sort of uh, uh, geochemistry and uh, petrographic work. Um, you know, evidence of the the right conditions uh, for the formation of mm. magmatic sulfide. And so far, we've found nothing um, that is uh, uh, is a negative. Uh, it's all been it's all been uh, good so far. So I, I think that's been very encouraging. You know that we've we've always been able to keep ticking those boxes um, and we haven't come across anything yet that uh, would suddenly tell you mm. you're barking up the wrong tree. Mm. So, um, you know, I think that's also what keeps us going because uh, we, we're constantly finding that the, the, that the conditions uh, that existed um, appear to favour the development of massive sulphides um, uh, on the KSZ. Good. Cool, excellent. Yeah, I think I think uh, we've pretty pretty much covered uh, just about every, every question, Mike. Probably any listeners would have, but that's what we do these podcasts for. Yeah. You know, to just try and to try and take it down a level so everybody understands. But I mean, obviously, having the presentation has been great, uh, and the visuals may you not know, a picture paints a thousand words sometimes. So that's. It's been great having you on, and like I say, we'll get you back on in the new year once you've got some more data, and uh, yeah. we'll keep an eye on Cavango and see what it does in the future, because there's definitely interesting times ahead, not just with the KSZ, but obviously you've got the, the, the Copper Belt, and you've got the uh, the Rare Earth project as well. So, yeah, lot, lots going on in the portfolio, and plenty to look forward to. So, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to... Uh, to explain it uh, all, and uh, it's been uh, been very enjoyable uh, to do so. Great. No, so, I think, and I hope I, people find it very interesting. I think it's something that, uh, yeah, is very useful to everyone who is interested in in you know in, in exploration and mining. Yep. All right. Cheers, Mike. I'll let you get back to your day, and we'll catch up with you later. Yep. Okay. Very Thanks, good. Mike. Thank you. Both. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening to another podcast from Market Musings with Fairben and Russell. Tune in next time.